Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. I am Shore Bozork Mary, the Divisional Director of Student and Academic Services at UCI's Office of Information Technology, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our panel. Today's event is brought to you by the newly formed Women in Technology Organization at UCI, which is dedicated to connect, inspire, and empower women in technology to reach their full potential as innovators and leaders. This vision is realized through strategic partnership, executive sponsorship, career development, and educational events. With perseverance, we bring awareness to gender imbalances, and we begin a creative approach toward improving diversity, equity, and inclusion. Our organization strives to strengthen the community of women in technology on campus. Its objective is to engage with the staff, faculty, students, and alumni of all genders and across all areas of campus, including the schools, central IT, and health. It is with great pleasure that the Women in Technology Advisory Board and Education Subcommittee present to you an inaugural panel on altered environments, new opportunities. We designed this virtual panel to create a space for conversation about the best ways to support women in technology and their allies who are making a difference. We are dedicating this panel to discuss how technology professionals can thrive and excel in this new virtual environment. We present to you a diverse and dynamic group of distinguished panelists of faculty and staff from across the UC system. The next 90 minutes will be broken down into three main parts. First, you will hear a keynote presentation by Dr. Judy Olson on making distance work work. And we will then kick off our panel on challenges and opportunities in our altered environment. For the final segment and time permitting, we will introduce questions that were submitted to the Q&A. We are recording this session and we'll make this recording publicly available on our website. I would now like to introduce our distinguished moderator, Dr. Deborah Richardson. Dr. Richardson is the professor emeriti of informatics. She served as the founding dean of the Donald Brent School of Information Computer Sciences at UC Irvine during a time of significant growth and change in the discipline. Her research and teaching focuses on software engineering for socially responsible causes. She received a bachelor's of science degree in mathematics from UC San Diego and a PhD in computer science from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Zipra has been a change maker. Being a founding dean provided her with opportunities to make a significant impact on a student outreach and retention, faculty development, teaching excellence, advancement of quality research and overall leadership of academic excellence. More importantly, she has focused her efforts toward increasing diversity, equity, and inclusivity in ICS more broadly at UCI and on a national level. The bulk of her service has been focused toward activities that have the potential to increase the number and diversity of students exploring the STEM fields. Dr. Richardson has always been committed to increasing the participation of women and underrepresented minorities in information technology. She's especially concerned about expanding and ensuring equitable access to computer science for girls, students of color, and low-income students. And in April, and in fall 2019, she joined me to support the establishment of the Women in Technology Organization at UCI and continues to be a strong advocate. Please join me in warmly welcoming Deborah. Thank you, Shore. Um, that was a, a, a long introduction and all we're, you're introducing me for right now is to introduce my first my keynote speaker, Judy Olson. So I had the pleasure of hiring Judy, actually, when I was Dean of Information and Computer Sciences. So I'm very happy to have her join us here today for this panel, but she's a perfect 
keynote speaker for this panel. She is a professor emerita of informatics as well, and she was she is the Donald Brent Professor of Information and Computer Sciences at UCI. And for over 30 years, she's researched teams whose members are not co-located. And a bunch of that work is summarized in a very uh, well-cited paper, highly cited paper called Distance Matters, and also in a recent book called Working Together Apart, which she co-authored with her husband. Um, at least I think that's what Olson and Olson is. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm sure I know it is. Uh, I would love to introduce <coughs> Judy and let her get started with her keynote and uh, tell us how we can make distance work. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Deborah. Let me uh, share my screen and we can get, get going. There we are. Yes, everybody good? Yep. Okay, good. Well, um, as Deborah said, I'm really delighted to be here to talk to you because of the work that Gary and I have been doing for 30 years. And though we've been looking at um, big science teams and big corporate teams, not anybody in a pandemic because we didn't have that then, thank goodness. Um, but there are lessons learned here um, that we could share with you. And uh, I'm trying to do something to make it, be it very practical for you. So a few things that you can do immediately. So as I said, um, second. Yeah, sorry, just have to get all the bugs out here. Um, we did not do work during the pandemic. So there are lots of difficulties in this current situation that some of our panelists certainly know because they also have children at home. Um, and there are tips for that that are going on Zoom and YouTube and everything that you should look at. But uh, that's not what I'm going to be talking about today. It's more like this. So you are at home, indeed, not your office, and not your office furniture, um, and not your office computer, um, with a bicycle in the background that has to have a, a, a fake background to cover up. Um, but this is more of the situation we're gonna talk about when you're home uh, safe and it's a quiet environment. So there are other interesting things uh, to compare this to. We are the slide on the right, um, but there'll be times maybe after the pandemic where some people still want to work from home or from a distance that there are lessons that we can we can learn and I'll talk about those today. But some of the difficulty if you are the person alone, the only person who is home, um, that this is a very unusual situation, this picture here. This is a stock photo, not what it really looks like when people, a singleton is elsewhere. Uh, they're usually on a laptop or on a, on a cart brought in. And in order to get their camera to see everybody in the room, they are quite far away. And that person is often forgotten. That's the difficulty of that. It's unlike the situation on the right-hand side where everybody's in the same boat and you can actually be empathetic about when the cat walks across in, in the screen or something happens behind you. Um, and the other situation where the, the only one, I have a colleague who was working from home alone uh, for a long time and he's and before we had uh, very cheap video like we have now, there was very expensive video and most of the meetings were audio only. But he developed what he called the telecommuter's cough. So if you're just a little box on the middle of the table and you're not saying things for a while, people forget you're there. And so he would go <coughs> and they say, oh yeah, oh yeah, he's there. Anyway, we all have workarounds. But the situation I'm going to talk about today is the one on the right-hand side where we're all in the same boat together. So here's the main message. Outside of your Zoom meetings, you are blind and invisible. You cannot see your teammates and what they're working on or whether they're even there, and you're invisible to them. For those not familiar with this particular picture, this is a picture from a 1933 movie called The Invisible Man. And it's a point where he is trying to be visible. And that's what I want to share with you. I want you to try to be visible in between your Zoom calls. So there are three things I want to help you with today. Um, one is to make sure you have the complete set of technologies. The second is the communication covenant. And the third is stand up meetings. So let's get to it. So the first one is not to uh, have just Zoom and your laptop, but actually think about the whole infrastructure and all the technologies you are using as a set. So 
the infrastructure, we just say, well, we've got the, the network, we're all on. Well, some people actually, their home, they've actually gone to a vacation home. And we have a friend of ours who's gone to their family vacation home up in the mountains. And when we have a Zoom call, and she is, uh, she has to go to the picnic table to outside to near the next door's house where they have, they do have network connectivity. So she's borrowing it. And so we see birds flying by and it is the mountains and it's beautiful. But you have to make sure that everybody has the infrastructure. One point uh, I read recently about the schools being online right now is that not a number of uh, less privileged families don't have internet. And so what the school does is put a hotspot in a, a van and drive it to their neighborhoods. And so giving them the connectivity that they lack. So thinking about the connectivity is important. The second thing is to look at your information repositories, and that's the uh, all the files and what they're going to be called and which ones are shared, and then your maybe your project management plan or you know all of your documents, and finding out where they are. Um, it could be on Dropbox, it could be in Google Docs, it could be a number of places, but you have to sort of understand where we're going to keep things. And then coming up to the communication, what we have to do is coordinate and decide who's going to be there when. And that can either be done through shared calendars or Doodle, our favorite thing, uh, where everybody's asked to check off which of the following boxes they're, they're able to come. Uh, easy to learn, uh, easy to use, um, very useful. That's an important technology. Excuse me a moment. When I talk, I get dry. Yeah. Right, for your synchronous or near synchronous communication, again, we've got Zoom or Teams or whatever you're going to be using. Um, there's email, there's chat, and there's things like Slack, which is email that's only for the people inside your group. Um, so you don't have it interleaved with uh, Amazon offers and things like that. So deciding what you're going to do um, and how you're going to communicate and are we going to reply all, all the time in email? All kinds of things like that. So the whole circle here is important to have the whole set of technologies. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the next item is to build a communication covenant. I've done this in a number of groups and we halfway through the project, we all say, I'm really glad we've got the covenant because we know what, to, what we're doing and how we're doing it. So the communication Communication covenant is a promise to each other that you're going to, for example, answer email several times a day, or we're going to do everything through chat. It's an understanding, first of all, how to reach each other. And it's both email and phone number. So you could decide which, which method you want to use. And then second is how often we'll communicate. And like, like I said, is it going to be every out? Do I have email on all the time? Or are we just going to meet at their Zoom meeting? So to deciding what's the best avenue for reaching everybody and always having cell phone numbers because if things don't work like they often do, either in Zoom or whatever you're in, we call it the first 10 minutes of hell. Uh, where are you going? And figuring out, you know, your volume is down or whatever. Anyway, how often we will communicate. Um, the third one is how we will share documents. So it's both where it is, like is it gonna be in Google Docs? Is it gonna be in Dropbox? Um, and then who has permission to change documents? So is it read only? Is it, um, you can comment but not edit? I had a, a, um, a paper that several of us were writing and we were doing it in Google Docs. And one of the co-authors said, just made comments in the aisle instead of actually doing the changes. And after a while, one of them said, um, add, a com add an example here. And I'm going, why don't you just do it? <laughs> don't make me do it. So you have to get an understanding to say all of that stuff out loud, write it in the document and everybody sign it. The last one is probably the most important. When you're working with other people, not everybody speaks the same kind of English. So people use acronyms, people use buzzwords like the word system. And it turns out that if you don't understand it, you have to ask the question. Because when you ask the question, you're actually helping somebody else as well. 
you're not the only one that doesn't understand that. So develop a culture where you're going to ask a question if you don't understand what's going on. So that's the communication covenant. You write that down and everybody signs it, or uh, I guess you can virtually sign things these days. Whatever. It's a promise to, um, to do that communication. The third one is the stand-up meetings, which is borrowed from software engineering Agile, and that every morning people will stand up. That makes sure that the meeting is short. And you go around the room and talking about what you're reporting out, what you're working on, where you are in it, what you're having trouble with, and if you have time, what you can offer somebody else. So it's a it's making yourself visible and you're and making everybody else visible to you. That where where are you in this project? Um, now that can be done virtually, and I really like the picture on the right hand side because the woman is indeed standing up, which we have to do to maintain health. In fact, I have my watch on, my Apple watch that every hour, if I haven't been standing up at all, it'll buzz me to stand up now. But anyway, the standing up is important for your health, and then it's also good for this coordination. So those are the three things. Uh, I have a complete set of technologies, I have a communication covenant, stand up meetings, and those things you can do soon. The stand up meetings don't have for you, don't have to be every morning, but they can, they have to be regular that you're expected to report out and to be visible to each other. So these are exciting times. There are things that are difficult about it that I want to help you with, which is being blind and invisible between your Zoom meetings. But let's think about the things that can, that do go well, that we can use in the future. So thank you. Thank you, Judy. Uh, so now I'm going to ask each of the panelists to just introduce themselves for a few minutes and talk a little bit about um, why they're here, why they want to participate on this panel, or why they agreed to participate on this panel. Um, and then we kind of gave them a couple of questions to start off with. What's it like to live and work in this remote environment, and how have things changed for them? And then what are some of the challenges and opportunities that women face during COVID-19 remote work that needs to be surfaced, discussed, and dealt with? So those are sort of just some overall questions. They may not really address those, but with that, I would like to start with Van Williams, who is the Vice Chancellor of Information Technology at UC Santa Cruz. Hey, thank you very much. It's great to be here. Uh, I like the uh... The two questions around, um, you know, why are you here and um, why are you here now? And uh, I'm here now uh, because I'm living the reality of remote work like everybody else. Uh, you know, I have uh, three children and I spend most of my days uh, in meetings and I watch through the window as my wife is actually engaged in trying to support the, the children um, in their education and their support and I continually try to juggle and step out of meetings to kind of chime in to help uh, but it is clear to me that um, what is happening right now with this COVID response um, it has so much greater impact on her uh, in her professional life um, than it is having on me um, and that is with an intentionality from my side to try to actually be engaged and I see that happening um, not just personally but I'm seeing it happening professionally with the women that I support as well, All right? And I think I've gotten to this point in terms of why I would actually even be open to this in the first place, because professionally, uh, I am a pygmy that's kind of standing on the shoulders of giants, many of whom, if not all of whom, have been women. And they have kind of been there to support me and to kind of really shape uh, my approach to work. And, uh, you know, it has to be basically something that I care about deeply because you know they've actually allowed me to, to grow as a person and I want to make sure that I continue to go out there and give back and you know I, I just want to give you know two very very quick examples uh, you know of this uh, you know as a young manager of 24 uh, you know I ended up having a tiny team of three um, you know in a software development shop and uh, all men in my shop and I had a uh, you know a senior colleague pull me aside one day after kind of engaging in a meeting where I was saying to somebody your code sucks right uh, or that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard and uh, you know she heard that took me under her wing and absolutely changed uh, my basically perspective 
around what it is to actually kind of engage as a civil caring human being, right? Um, and I think she also basically took me under her wing when she did not have to and really kind of mentored me through so many stages of my life and brought me up to other mentors through so many stages of my life. And, you know, for now, where I'm at 22 years later, um, you know, or, or getting on that, um, you know, I can tell you that the need to kind of have that level of thought around the gender differences and the guidance is actually still here. And, um, you know, as an example, I uh, am in my new job and I have uh, a woman that I work with and that I support um, who I am absolutely certain, basically, I will be working for her one day. She is just that strong and effective of a manager and a leader. Right. And when we moved her into the role that she had, you know, some of the reaction from some of the people in the organization, you know, it was, well, you know, she doesn't have any experience in this technical thing or why should she be here? And it's like, for me, I look at it and I think to myself, you know, you are a strong, competent manager and woman. And today in 2020, we are still kind of engaged in these things where we're operating in this very male centric way. Uh, and not basically doing the work as leaders to support it. So that is why I'm here. I'm, I'm trying to lend my voice to support what's happening both personally and what I've seen continually professionally. Thank you, Van. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Jen Stringer. Jen is, is the Associate Vice Chancellor for IT and CIO at UC Berkeley. Well, thank you, Deborah. And uh, Van, that's hard to follow that. I love you, Van. Um, uh, that, was yeah. a, that was a great, um, that was actually a great story. And it, it spurred me to decide that I'm going to change, change what I was going to say, actually, um, based on that. But um, why here, why now for me um, is, uh, first of all, I'm a new CIO. I've been in the role less than, I think, six or seven weeks. Um, I started at the beginning of July. Um, I was the deputy CIO at UC Berkeley before that and was running the COVID um, response for IT. So um, I think I saw it really close up in terms of the impact that, um, that this current crisis is having on women and caregivers in general. Um, I am lucky. Uh, my children are 28 and 30, and uh, my husband and I every day say, I can, we cannot, we are in awe of um, the heavy lift that many women are, are doing right now in terms of working and especially, you know, caring for um, members of the household and, homes and homeschooling. My, my two daughters actually happen to be teachers and are doing, um, they teach uh, fourth grade and um, they are middle school counselors. So um, I'm, I'm seeing sort of both ends of the spectrum there in terms of the, the heavy lifting that people are doing. Uh, I also want to say that uh, I think it's, our responsibility as not just leaders. So I'm in a leadership position and I'm incredibly lucky that I can make decisions that I hope benefit um, the people who work within my organization. Um, I will say that the UC system has, I believe done some amazing work around COVID leave. And um, I, I hope that uh, managers are, are providing the guidance to their staff about taking it. Um, encouraging them, encouraging them to, um, you know, take that time and not feel at all guilty um, at all about that, or that that will somehow impede their ability um, to move up in their careers later on. Or honestly, in our current financial situation at many of our campuses, um, it's also our job to ensure that we are um, enabling people to take that time without concern that that will somehow impact on their job, uh, their ability to keep their job or people's um, perceptions of their job performance. So I think I was sort of wanted to throw that out there. I'm gonna do a way back to Van in terms of standing on the um, shoulders of giants, um, but, but many and most of uh, my mentors were men. Um, and the story when I was uh, 22 years old and had my first child, I was working in the, in the engineering library at Stanford University and um, I was breastfeeding and the School of Engineering had um, 
different, <laughs> uh, believe it or not, different, the restrooms in the women's office, they had one stall, whereas the men's restrooms had more stalls because it was built in the 50s and men were engineers and women were not. And so they actually, the bathrooms were different in number. Um, that was where it was suggested that I would pump. And um, my boss, who was the head of the engineering library, Steve Gass, gave up his office to me twice a day so that I could pump my breast milk and put it in the refrigerator because there were no such thing as lactation rooms back then. This was a man who had no children, had chosen not to have children, and yet um, enabled me to continue to do my work. So I think that that we all, so I would challenge not just women, but men to think about how can you be enablers? Um, someone like that, it, it, you know, be that person, be that Steve Gass um, to the women in your organization right now. As Van, I, I am sure that you are being, I'm going to call you Steve from now on. Um, yeah. But, um, but I, I do think it's important to recognize that um, it's also not just leadership. Uh, this is about being a good colleague um, and being um, someone who, you know, recognizes um, when you can pick up the load and somebody else cannot. And also advocating um, for people who may not feel as comfortable um, stepping up and stepping out and asking for what they need. I'm going to end um, my, my thing with just the opportunities, which is I think that there's some amazing opportunities right now for women. Um, given what we just saw in terms of the, um, the great equalizer, I, I feel like Zoom has been a great equalizer in a lot of ways. That back channel chat, um, the ability to speak up without having to raise your hand or butt into a conversation if you feel uncomfortable, um, has been uh, amazing in terms of, um, I think, hearing additional voices. I will just um, share one quick example, which is when I'm sitting in cabinet, my chancellor is watching that chat and she will actually bring out pieces of the chat that people have said um, and give them an additional voice. She's watching that chat and people who I know would never have spoken up in cabinet before are given a voice in a very different way because of that one piece of, the, of, um, of technology that's enabling voices in different ways. So I'll stop there. Um, and I'm excited to hear other panelists and answer questions. Thank you, Jen. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Katie Chappelle. Um, Katie is a manager at, for communications and training in the Office of Information Technology at UC Irvine. Great. Thanks, Deborah, um, for the introduction, and I'm glad to be here with you all. Um, I was, I, I have to admit, a bit taken aback when I was invited to be part of this panel um, because I'm still getting used to considering myself as um, a woman in technology. Um, so I've spent a good bit of my career in higher education, um, but more recently in a management role and more recently in an IT um, unit within that um, industry. And so um, as I was thinking about why I might want to participate in this panel, there were definitely a few things um, that kind of came to the surface. And um, what's interesting is that one of them, um, actually, Judy, you uh, talked a little bit about earlier in your keynote, which was I had an opportunity to do some remote work um, about two years ago in a role that I was in, and I was the only person doing remote work. And I had multiple experiences where um, I was on a laptop at the end of the table in a boardroom <laughs> and everyone else was gathered around. And it was just, it was impossible to have a voice and to speak. Um, and the only way it even remotely worked was um, was because I had one particular coworker who really wanted to see remote work become a thing. And so she made a point of stopping, pausing and saying, you know, Katie, would you like to add anything? Because there's just nothing like um, being the one virtual presence in a room of, of you know, physical people that, um, that gives you that opportunity. So um, I'm very thankful for that. Um, I'm also, you know, newly in a management role. And what's interesting is I've been at UCI for a year. 
And I now have hit um, the point where I've spent more time working remotely in my job than I spent on campus. And so um, trying to you know, navigate what my role is um, because it was new when it was created and then trying to navigate um, you know, management in a remote environment has been um, really interesting. And then finally, um, you know, as my fellow panelists um, have have also shared, you know, parenting in the midst of both a pandemic and remote work um, brings its own set of challenges. And I actually came back from um, a maternity leave into remote work um, and so at the end of March. And so um, not only dealing with what does this transition look like, um, but coming back uh, with a newborn at home as well as two others. Um, so navigating what, uh, what that looks like, what my schedule looks like, how we're managing the workload and how I'm also um, trying to be considerate of my team members um, while also asking for what I need from my bosses in terms of uh, accommodations or just understanding that there's going to be a baby crying um, half the time and um, I'm going to be doing some of those standing meetings mostly because I have someone on my lap uh, or um, in my arms. And so uh, those have been um, some of the, the lessons that I um, have, am still really working through. So I would definitely say um, I'm spending a good bit of time thinking through those things right now. Um, I don't have a lot of answers, uh, but I'm grateful for the opportunity to chat a little bit more about it. Um, the other thing that I really wanted to share is, and I think, you know, this is true for all of us working in IT, is not just how are we adjusting to working remotely as if we were doing all of the same things now from home but our i mean at least for me my work um, my priorities and my tasks and my projects have pretty dramatically changed uh, over the last six months and so it's also been an exercise in how do we be flexible how do we reprioritize how do we decide how much of our time and effort covid related projects are getting and what do we um what do we need to still focus on you know just to kind of keep the, the engine running. And so um, also exploring a lot of those. So, um, <clears throat> you know, Zoom has been, I think, as Jen shared, a really great tool, um, a really interesting tool for us, but it's also um, can be a source of exhaustion. Um, I'm spending a lot more time on camera um, looking at myself, which is also odd, and also a lot more time talking. Um, and there's a, you know, there's a, its own exhaustion in just that constant meetings. I feel like we're in more meetings than we ever were before with fewer breaks than we ever were before. And so thinking through, um, you know, what, what meetings could be emails has been <laughs> at the top of my mind. Um, what, what meetings could be emails, what, what has been a topic for a long time, but, um, but especially in this world where there's so many status update meetings. I think that's been something that I have spent a lot of time thinking about and exploring with my small group, um, my, my small team, and also just um, exploring how we can make the meetings that we are having effective and worthwhile. Um, and then providing opportunities for connection. So um, I think there are some very unique challenges presented with remote work and remote work when you have um, caregiving responsibilities. And there's some also some really unique opportunities for women in technology and their careers that they can leverage during this, this opportunity. Thank you, Katie. Judy, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, uh, people were talking about their heroes in their careers, and I certainly had a number of them along the way. And I wanted to report on one. That was my department chair when I was first hired as an assistant professor, and that was the year I came in pregnant. And so I had to talk to him about how this was going to work, about my teaching load and my other responsibilities. And he said, well, um, tell me what you want to do. I said, well, I'd like to work half time for a while. And he said, okay, well, you're half time. And he said, tell me, tell me quarter by quarter how much you want to be working. And, you know, so you have time to raise your child. Uh, and so over the first four years, when I produced two daughters, um, I was half time, half time, quarter, three quarter time, three quarter time. And I realized I was working as much 
three quarter time as I would full time. So I went full time for a while, but then the second baby came. And then, and the important thing was my tenure accrued at the time I was in the chair. So um, I, ha I could do, you know, like eight calendar years or whatever uh, to prove that I could do my job. And that was a wonderful accommodation. I wish it had been adopted by everybody. It didn't, unfortunately. But he was my hero. Thanks, Judy. So we're going to go to our questions now. Um, but I wanted to mention that if you have questions, those the, the participants in the audience, if you have any questions, you can post them in the Q&A. And if we have time at the end, uh, we have people in the background going through those questions and they will um, pose, kind of combine them together and pose a few questions. So um, that's your opportunity to ask our esteemed panelists some, some uh, questions. Okay. So my first question though is for Katie. And um, we're going to kind of focus on ways to be effective in this new environment. Um, so I'd like to ask her, how do you best assert yourself in the workplace, this virtual workplace, and ensure you are being heard when the environment is now virtual and opportunities are more limited? And my dog's barking in the background now. <laughs> Thanks, Deborah. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, there's a couple of things that I've been intentional about doing and a few things that have just um, kind of happened and then I realized that they, there were benefits to me doing them. So one of those, one of those things is um, I was feeling overwhelmed with the amount of tasks and the amount of asks that my team was getting. And so um, where I had previously kind of had a haphazard project management platform, I realized I needed a little bit more organization. And so I created, I used Trello, I created kind of, you know, layout of all the projects, some of the status, some of the tasks, you know, and assignments that had been um, floated out so that I could keep better track of them. And then I realized that it was going to be a really effective tool to share with other people, um, including my leadership, what the projects were that were on my plate and what I needed help with and what I needed um, to share with them so that they could understand where my priorities um, lie to any, at any given time. And so um, that proved to be an effective tool that I didn't intend um, for, you know, necessarily for sharing or for um, getting opportunities to to show what, what I was working on and what kinds of things were on my plate. Um, so that just kind of happened. Um, and that worked out effectively. But the other thing is, um, is a situation where I had been asked to, um, you know, conduct a lot of communications on a topic that I just didn't have information about. And I kind of did some asking around um, through chat and through various um, colleagues that I had and realized that there was, I think, a relatively important status meeting that was happening regularly. And um, a lot of the information that I needed to do the work that I was being asked to do was happening at that meeting. And so um, I had the opportunity then to just ask for a seat at that table to be able to both do my work better, but also have access to some of the leadership that I typically might only run into in the hallway. But um, now I had the opportunity to have a little bit of visibility at that level and um, to get the information that I needed to continue to move forward. So those are a couple um, of examples, but I also think, um, you know, it's important and it's been a top of mind to to listen and advocate for those who are not in management and leadership positions. And so I've also been intentional about reaching out to some of those colleagues that I had just started to get to know before we were remote um, to just ask them, you know, what their work is like and what opportunities they're looking for to give them opportunities um, within this remote world. Thanks, Katie. Um, Judy, have there been any unexpected positives or benefits that you've noticed from this remote work environment? Oh, yes. Either in, your, either in your 30 years of working or in your <laughs> six months of working at home. <laughs> well, I just think Zoom. 30 years and, of research. Yeah, I think Zoom and other uh, team and all kinds of other video systems these days are wonderful. And we're discovering them because we had to. Um, and, you know, we learn from each other about 
we're going to put the questions in the chat and we're going to you know make sure we're all this background and not wear something that's the color of your background or your body you know we're learning all that and we can use that in in the future so i'm, I'm delighted about that also even in when we're doing video um i can see everybody's reaction i don't have to look around the table like this to see if somebody's listening or not uh, I can see it all at once, and that's that's a nice feature uh, that I really appreciate. Um, I think that's that's the main things that I think are are good. I think people are finding that they can connect this way, and therefore are connecting with family members this way or friends this way. Um, and because everybody's discovered Zoom. Jen, how about you? Have you noticed any benefits or positives that have <clears throat> resulted from this environment? I have, um, and, and I'm actually gonna call Katie out a little bit to say um, I, that I love seeing babies on maps and I love hearing barking dogs in the background, I really do. And I actually know that it, it seems to soften a meeting in such a way, it, it personalizes, I think, the experience of everybody involved um, when you see, you know, the, the, you, you see the kid come and whisper in the parent's ear um, or someone say, you know what, I have to step away for a second. I actually think that's really important. I think it humanizes the experience for us um, in a way that um, especially, especially now because we are so disassociated with people um, during COVID times and um, uh, not being able to to reach out and connect. I'm a I'm a touchy person. You know, I like to see people in the hallway. Um, I like to you know reach out and pat a shoulder um, and hear about what's happening in people's lives. And um, so I love kind of the little window, um, like many people I think, is where you know watching our newscasters and seeing what they have on their bookshelves, um, which was sort of a big deal at one point. Um, I think that that is, has an unexpected benefit. Um, I would also, I wanna piggyback on something that Katie said too about her work changing. Um, I, while it's not a, necessarily a, a benefit of remote work environment, I think that there's some benefits that um, honestly the, the crisis brings sometimes to allow people opportunities to do work that they wouldn't have otherwise or to step into roles and take um, a leadership um, opportunity or, on, or, or take on just an opportunity to run a new service. So we, ran, we spun up Zoom on our campus um, from less than 2000 users to 65,000 users in less than two weeks. Um, and that was actually a new service lead and an opportunity for an organization to um, really kind of strut their stuff and, and encourage staff to step up in new ways. So I'll stop there, but, um, but I think that those are two things that I think have been unexpected um, in their positivity. Thanks, Jen. Um, Van, often meetings in the technology field or the technology field in general are dominated by men, is dominated by men. Um, how can organizations help to ensure that women's voices are heard in this environment? That You're muted. Darn mute. So it's a great question. Can I chime in on the Jen and the, uh, and the Katie question first? Of course. Awesome. You know, I, I think one of the opportunities that we uh, have that, um, you know, I guess Zoom is the great equalizer on is the fact that, um, you know, because we have uh, the meeting dynamics of when people are in person, right, of the leader sits at the head of the table, right, um, as the power position. And then you have the person that sits next to the right hand of God. Right. And, you know, so on and so forth. Right. That dictates so much of, you know, whether or not people feel empowered um, to have a conversation or not, or the person that's actually sitting on the opposite end of the table has to be very mindful not to come across as being oppositional because of that structure. Right. So I think that's one thing that's actually really an important opportunity to leverage. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking also of a colleague uh, who, you know, former colleague who was a very physical man, right? And he communicated in a very physical way, 
right? You know, think kind of Donald Trump debating Hillary Clinton, you know, zooming, you know, over the top of it. And that actually created a tremendous amount of intimidation. And it was a style of communication that he had that was a very gendered style. Um, that also gets mitigated tremendously via Zoom, and it may actually, you know, contribute to encouraging people uh, to participate more. So I think on the uh, on the question around, you know, how can organizations ensure that women's voices are heard? Uh, I think the, the first thing is, uh, you know, this is probably not just in meetings, right? So it's kind of like, how do we ensure that women's voices are heard in the organization, right? And the first and the simplest thing. Uh, you know, kind of has to be, you know, well, let's make sure that women are at the table, right? And let's make sure that they stay at the table, right? In order for their voices to be heard, right? So I'll, I'll put that there on the side. I think the second thing about this is that, you know, we started talking about this, you know, in the context of Zoom. And, uh, you know, we can use Zoom to make things a lot easier as well. That raise hand function um, works really, really, you know, effectively if you agree to it as a meeting protocol. Um, you know, adopting tiny little things like, you know, going round robin when there's an issue for discussion to make sure that all the voices are heard and that everybody has an equal amount of time. Um, you know, there are things uh, called liberating structures, which are just, you know, techniques to facilitate collaboration and engagements um, that, you know, engage and sometimes doing small groups, sometimes taking an idea and having it circulate around. I think if we leverage a lot of these things, uh, you know, that will actually level the, the playing field. Uh, but I also kind of want to acknowledge that if 93% of body language, uh, you know, is kind of, or 93% of communication is nonverbal, right? We're still actually kind of missing some of those, uh, those pieces as well that we have to be very sensitive about. And I know for me, there have been so many people where I've kind of actually just lost, uh, you know, the fact that somebody has been uncomfortable because I can't see them squirming, uh, you know, in the same way. Right, or the audio uh, quality doesn't actually let me hear the crack in their voice. And so that also means that as an organization, we have to kind of train our managers, right, to be kind of very extra sensitive and remind ourselves continuously to be extra sensitive to try to do what we can to read those nonverbal cues through a medium that was not really designed for that. Thanks, Ben. Judy, in your, the course of your research, have you noticed anything? Have you come up with any things that we can do to help make sure women's voices are heard when it's a field that's dominated by men? I think the ideas that Van had just talked about are ideal. I talk about going around the room, making sure that everybody's heard, a round table. Um, that's used fairly often. Um, and I like the idea that we're more equal um, by position. In fact, I want to talk to Zoom about can I move the, the squares around in my gallery view? Um, because I want some, the person I'm looking at to be close to the camera. That's one of the things is you have to move your, your, what you're looking at close to the camera. Now it's me and I don't want to see me close to my camera. I want to move these around. But uh, unfortunately that might then uh, create the head of a table uh, and power positions. So we'd have to be careful about how that's actually enacted. And I have no idea what the algorithm is for Zoom now. It's, I don't think it's, I don't know what it is. Is it the first one who gets there gets to be on the upper left? <laughs> I don't know, but I'd like some power over that. Or someone should have some power over that. There you go. <laughs> the, the, the meeting organizer at least or something, mm -hmm. yes. Um, so now we're gonna turn to some challenges. Um, uh, and during the COVID-19 pandemic, disproportionate, we all, I think, recognize that disproportionate caregiving and household responsibilities are borne by women. So I want to kind of explore that with people. So Jen, um, how can we best mind the disproportionate impact on women? Yeah, and actually, I'm 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 looking at the Q and A in, and I know we're waiting to the end, but somebody had a great question um, in the Q and A that that speaks exactly to I think the, I noticed. Yeah, which had to do with the disproportionate um, uh, uh, burden that women have con continued and you know have always and continue 
um, to have in terms of childcare in general. And the question by the attendee was, um, anonymous attendee, was that um, do, do, we, do I think or do some of us think that um, this might equalize the need for childcare accommodation across all genders? And I think the question is, since maybe men are seeing this like Van, uh, for example, watching his, um, Steve, you know, um, watching his wife um, do a lot of the caregiving as he's in meetings. Um, and while she also, I know, has a, a job as well. So um, I think that one of the things that we need to be mindful of, and I sort of mentioned at the beginning, is encouraging people um, to, to take leave when they need to and to not feel guilty about it. So we have to create um, and I will say, I think this is really hard. I think um, oftentimes people in general are the hardest on themselves and they're concerned about whatever the perception is. They're concerned if they come late. They're concerned if they, um, if they take leave when, and people will be looking at them. They're concerned if they you know, say that they need to step away um, because their child needs them. Um, and I think that we have to find ways um, to ensure that that is that is really okayed okayed by um by senior leadership as well as others um i also think that we need to think about how and when we schedule our meetings um a lot of people katie mentioned you know the the zoom exhaustion um, one of the things that our campus has done is really encourage no meetings on friday afternoons period um, it, uh, it, I have to say that, um, I, that the people who are really good about it um, are sort of mid-level managers. I've seen it's been fantastic. Um, we do not put any regular meetings on Friday afternoons. I will also say the place that, um, that I see it probably broken the most is with senior leadership, and we need to be thoughtful about that in terms of you know, um, asking people to come to meetings because that's the only free time you have now on your calendar. Um, so I think that that's some of, those are some of the ways that we can think about that disproportionate impact. Katie, you are dealing with a child at home right now, and do you have any comments on this question? Yeah, I'm, um, you know, I'm fortunate to essentially be working with about a 50-50 childcare split, um, which is great because I do have three um, under six at home. Um, so they're not just at home, they're very needy stages. Um, I think, you know, one of the biggest things for me to feel um, confident about having those responsibilities and trying to manage has been a couple of things. And one of them has just been seeing that modeled um, by senior leadership. So to not just have lip service paid to, yes, we know, you know, we understand your kids are at home and that's a challenge, um, but to have, um, to have, you know, to see senior leaders with um, dealing with some of their responsibilities and um, to have that those accommodations modeled to see those, you know, as Jen shared, um, you know, those standards of no meetings at certain times or just ending the day at a reasonable hour or whatever those boundaries might be, seeing them modeled by senior leadership is really what gives the rest of the employees in the organization permission because there's um, what's said and then there's, you know, the underlying culture and if, if your perception is that that you might be told it's okay, but no one else is doing it and you don't really feel like you have the freedom to do it or you feel like there might be some consequence for not being available at a certain time, um, then, then it's not going to move us forward. It's not going to give those people real permission. It's just gonna lay a burden of guilt um, onto parents who are already feeling burdened and guilty. So I think that's you know hugely important. And I think you know just listening and understanding also from a from a you know someone who's a middle manager you know who um is is dealing with her, her own staff and and their dynamics is really just listening and understanding to everybody's individual situation because the reality is that there are some people who are totally thriving in remote work um who things are working well for who may even have some more capacity um there are those who are feeling you know the mental burden or physical burden of what's happening and maybe don't have 
caregiving responsibilities, but have those. Um, and those are taking a toll and those are real and they need, you know, to be, we need to be considerate of those as well. And then for people who maybe like me just need some schedule accommodation. So I block out some time during the day so I can be available and I get some of my most productive work done between the hours of 9 and 11 p.m. because that's when my household is quiet. And even when I'm not directly caring for kids, having that quiet focus time is more what I miss than anything else. And so um, so, so th that accommodation for me has been kind of what worked. And so I don't think there's one size fits all um, way we can go about it. I think we need to be open and be flexible to what's working for individuals as well. Thanks, Katie. I think you kind of touched upon our next question, so I'm going to pass this one to Van. Do you have any advice for managers and supervisors on how to best support employees in this altered environment? What strategies work? Yeah, you know, I think the, the first thing that we all have to do is, you know, as managers and supervisors is make sure that you're taking care of yourself. Uh, you know, it is really, really difficult uh, to provide support to your team, and you know, like Katie, I you know I do have three, I'm three under seven, uh, and you know they can really you know wear you out, and that can kind of translate into uh, the way that you kind of engage or the energy that you kind of bring. So you have to be mindful to kind of um, invest in that. I think the other one is making sure that you're going out there and being very open and transparent and speaking publicly and frequently about your support and the need for all of the managers and all of the supervisors to be generous to you know, our staff during this time, uh, to remind them that they're here to kind of actually support the staff and not the other way around. Uh, and as much as you can kind of model that, uh, make sure that you do that as well. I think, and the general day-to-day -day interactions from a management, make sure that you provide the room for the personal. You know, I think um, you know, right now, uh, you know, not necessarily by design, but it works. Uh, you know, almost every one of our daily standups, um, you know, we kind of start off a little bit with, a, you know, a personal check-in, right? How are you doing? Right. And I think making that room for the personal, um, you know, either in how you open up meetings or, you know, how you support and engage with family when they actually intrude upon the meetings. I know that, you know, my team is just absolutely phenomenal with it um, you know they kind of like both understand where i'm laughing sometimes if i have a kid making funny faces at me or uh you know today um you know one of my team members daughter uh, showed up but she was actually kind of you know uh, making a little bit of a change to the working schedule to her kids working schedule and brought her to the meeting and you know i kind of said well hold on a second i have a seven-year-old too let me go and bring him in and you know get the two of them to say hi and that's a really special you know, moment. It, it's humanizing, it's personal. And, uh, you know, I think I might also go out there and just say, you know, finding time to laugh um, with your team, right? I mean, it is so stressful. Uh, and, you know, we all get caught up, especially in IT, especially with the COVID response, right? Um, we're so caught up in the time pressures of getting things done. Um, finding that time to laugh is just, you know, incredible. And then, I think maybe uh, the, my last two things is one, um, just being conscientious about checking in and asking for feedback. And that this is not a, a how is the person doing? This is basically how am I doing as a manager and supporting you, right? And making sure that you don't go too long without that touch base and asking, you know, what do you need to do better in order to change? Because sometimes people won't really give it to you unless you ask and force them to think about it, right? And I, I will just put a plug out, um, you know, this is, um, yeah, I think this is about the, you know, how we support employees, um, not just, uh, you know, how we support women. And I want to point out that there is, you know, kind of a distinct difference around the racial side of here in terms of like how the impact is based upon race and, you know, white women, um, white men, um, Asian women, Asian men are way more likely to actually be working in jobs that support remote support. Um, whereas Hispanic and blacks are actually, you know, in jobs where they're forced to kind of come in. And I think that there needs to be kind of like, you know, a, a certain level of care and thought um, being put into what the structures are that we kind of put in place to support people, um, not just based upon gender, but also kind of based upon, um, you know, what their particular situations are and, you know, to the degree that you can structure their work so that it's asynchronous as opposed to kind of needing to kind of be there at a particular time, make sure that we go out there and do that. Um, you know, if we can support informal support networks for families, 
right? Either basically financially or by providing the communication infrastructure to say, hey, does anybody need to kind of get some help? A um, little challenging in the time of COVID, but still I think thought should be put into that as managers. I have a, a, a thing I just want to piggyback on that band for just a second, if, if y'all don't mind. Um, I, I also, um, you know, our, um, our black and brown um, colleagues who are working uh, mainly on our campuses um, doing, uh, who are many of them designated as essential workers. Um, one of the, the key things that I have been thinking about as a leader um, and pushing really hard is around the fact that those of us who can work remotely lower the risk as if we do, we lower the risk for those who are essential personnel who are actually having to work um, not remotely. So I have heard a lot of folks who would love to be an essential personnel, who'd love to come into their office a couple of days a week because it, they're so much more productive. Um, you know, we hear that actually from faculty quite frequently. I, I'd really like to come in to, to, to work on my, you know, curriculum. Um, I, will, I will hold research aside because there is some research that needs to be done on campus and is essential. Um, but one of the things that it seems to me um, that is incredibly important in COVID times particularly is for those of us who can work from home remotely and stay away from places that um, introduce risk with the more bodies that we put on campus. Um, that's an incredibly important thing. And that's where also that, um, you know, enabling people who have young children at home to have flex schedules um, so that they can actually stay remote if possible um, actually reduces the risk for people who must be on campus. And I think that that's something that um, I don't know that it is said often enough or um, articulated well to folks who really would love, like me, honestly, um, I would love to be in my office right now. Um, I, I'm not a great at home worker. I'm not as, I don't feel as productive, but I know that I'm keeping the campus, um, I'm reducing the risk for people on campus by staying at home. Thanks, Jen. That is very important. Um, next, we're going to talk a little bit about advancement in these times, and I want to ask, start with Katie. Is this the right time for making a calculated career move? You just made one. Um, and how can women be more brave under uncertainty in making career decisions? Yeah, um, so I made a career move last summer um, to come to UCI and um, what made it challenging or I suppose calculated is that um, I actually found out we were expecting a baby between my first and second interviews. And so um, I had to make the decision about whether I wanted to take the risk to start in a new workplace not knowing um, really what the environment was going to be like and understanding that I wasn't going to have the same protections that I would um, because I didn't qualify for um, the Family Medical Leave Act because I didn't have the amount of time um, you know under uh, under my belt yet so I um, I had to make that decision ultimately and here so <laughs> I decided it was a good risk but it definitely um, it definitely made me think a lot about why women feel so um, apprehensive about making somewhat risky career moves. I mean, that wasn't dramatically risky. I didn't have to move across the country or, or um, anything, but, but why we feel so um, burdened by taking risks and why it feels easier to make safe career moves um, or to not make career moves because that's safer. Um, and so I, I certainly think that I, if I could do anything um, on say anything on this topic, it would be to encourage um, any woman who's considering it to absolutely take the risk uh, because I think there's very there's very little worst case scenario thinking that um, that actually gets you to a scenario that that's not work aroundable. Um, everything I think there's a book actually everything is figure outable. So uh, so I and I encourage that for a couple of reasons. One being um, you know the challenge that 
that women generally have, which is feeling like they need to, and this is documented, feeling like they need to have more qualifications than is required rather than just a few and jumping into it. Um, I think if you have gotten to a point where you might be considered for a job, then you're probably a good fit for the job. And so um, that's one thing that has given me some confidence to move forward in my career um, is basically I've, you know, if, if someone's interested, that's already a good sign. And so I need to pursue this, um, even if it does make me a little bit uncomfortable or I'm a little unsure of what the expectations might be on, on me. Um, so that's uh, one thing. And then I think, you know, as we've already discussed in various ways, there are some unique opportunities that COVID presents. And I think if we can be really mindful of where we can in, um, ask for a seat at the table and where we can advocate for ourselves and where we can make connections that weren't as easy to do before we were remote, then this is absolutely the time to be doing that. Um, we've also you know, discussed that you know, COVID in particular and the projects and the, the needs that have come up as a result of responding to this very dramatic um, interruption of the way that we work and the way that our campus works is that there's opportunities galore to prove your abilities in certain areas to volunteer to take on new projects even if that means that you know you are doing the juggling act of, of managing family life because those are the opportunities that are going to give you some visibility and give you an opportunity to to move to move ahead Thanks, Katie. Does anyone have anything they'd like to add to that before we move on? Can, can I just add that? Um, Jen? Yeah, I, I do. I, I, a couple of quick things. Um, one is, uh, this is also, I'm a big believer in like, talk to the recruiters, put yourself out there. Um, it is a chance to get a sense of where your skill sets um, uh, might be interesting to people. Um, I, I would say that, you know, you can always say no, but you can't say no if you don't take the shot. Um, and so there's really, to Katie's point about risk, the risk in exploring new opportunities, um, I, I would really encourage folks. Um, this is a great time because some of so we, are, you know, there are lots of people looking to still hire, believe it or not, even in the UC system. Um, even in our current financial constraints, we are approving certain kinds of jobs that we need. Um, and there are opportunities out there for people who are interested um, and people who are hiring managers, like, um, like some of us are, are more than willing to have chats with people just even to explore whether it would be, you know, the skill set um, is of interest and that kind of thing. So I would really encourage people um, to, to put themselves out there and Nobody, nobody gets mad if you say no. It's really, I, you know, I just, I can't say that enough to say, you know, you can take it, uh, take it all the way up to the end stage to decide whether it's a good fit for you at the right time. Um, and I think a lot of people are, um, are worried somehow about that. So I would encourage people to think about that as well. Hey Deb, can I chime in as well? Well, I, I guess I have. So I, I, yeah, I will say, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I will say um, always listen to Jen for good advice because, you know, she helped me get this job here as well. And, uh, you know, I think the other thing is, I think historically, if you look at, um, you know, the, the stock market, um, you know, most of the companies that have like a lot of major returns have actually been founded during economic downturns. Now, if you go and you translate that out, into kind of job opportunities, it means that, yep, there's high risk, but there's also kind of high reward in terms of being able to kind of get into opportunities that might actually have, you know, real growth and real kind of legs from a professional um, perspective. And so I would keep that in mind as well. Great. Thanks, Van. I was going to follow up with Jen about interviewing and um, what things are okay or not okay in these times in interviewing, and that's a very different environment for people, obviously, um, what things are more or less appropriate? Yeah, that's a great question. How do you dress? 
Yeah, How do you exactly. Dress? Right. Well, Janice, Janice Hong asked a question about dressing too. So, so this is a perfect Janice. I'm going to address your question in this answer as well. Um, so I did, I interviewed for the CIO job at Berkeley um, completely um, virtually. And um, so all of my interviewing was done virtually. And I will tell you, I had, I had shorts on. It was a really hot time of the year. I had shorts on and then I had this shirt on, on top, you know, not this particular shirt, but you know, a dressy shirt on um, and no one knew the difference. Um, I also will say that, uh, believe it or not, I think that men, uh, you know, I see more ties um, sometimes now in collared shirts than I did before. So um, Janice was asking about men versus women and feeling presentable. Um, I don't know whether that's the case. I think all of us, because we're staring ourselves in the face all the time on Zoom, um, are much more uh, aware of our appearance. And so I would just take that with a grain of salt. Um, I, I, I do make decisions about what I'm going to wear based on who I'm addressing. Um, just like I pick my background, uh, honestly, um, in terms of when and who I'm addressing. So if I were interviewing, I would definitely pick a different virtual background. Um, when I am in my team meetings, um, people know I'm a, I'm a burner. I, I go to Burning Man and I have these beautiful pictures of all of my Burning Man experiences, beautiful art. And I always pick those to put up because people ask about them. You know, oh, what is that? Oh, tell me about that one. Um, so I think that there are times to be casual like that. The interview is not one of those times. The interview is also not one of the times to put your child on your lap. I'll, I'll be blunt. That's, that would not be, that would, that would be the time that you ask the, the, your, um, your partner um, to, to make sure that that's not the case so that the barking dog is um, away. So I would think about those things as well. Um, I would also say that because we're on camera and we're watching ourselves, it's a great chance to practice. Like, I'm not saying that um, there is nothing wrong with video capturing, recording yourself, answering some questions and watching them. That is a really good thing to do, not a bad thing to do. Um, and I would encourage anyone who's getting ready to interview or present that you actually have a great chance because you're gonna know exactly what you look like when you're on Zoom, if you record yourself um, giving your presentation and then watch it back. Um, also practice with, you know, colleagues. I used to do that before. I would practice in the car. I would practice um, with my mom or my kids to, to, you know, ask them to give me feedback. Um, but now I don't even have to do that because I just record myself and, you know, watch it back. So I would really encourage folks to sort of take advantage of some of those tools and resources um, from the technology side that we didn't have before. I hope that was some practical, super practical advice. Thanks, Jen. Um, so this is for Van to start. Um, organizations have a responsibility to create an open and welcoming virtual environment by seeking diversity of thoughts, which is linked to gender diversity. How can managers or supervisors ensure remote work environments are welcoming to all, especially women? So there is my unmute. Yeah, this is a great, uh, this is a great question. Uh, I would say that uh, the first thing is to recognize that we have to use just some of the basic principles of good management uh, in general, right? So that, that includes um, making sure that we do something that we talked about before. Um, let's ask for feedback and, you know, hopefully listen to the feedback and, and react to it. Uh, I think the second one is being really mindful, uh, you know, now more than ever about creating a culture of gratitude and appreciation and being really intentional around uh, ensuring that your managers are all trained in how to do that, that you have good processes in place that encourage the right type of behavior from them so that we know that they're actually going through and doing that. And then going out there and actually making sure that you're kind of creating the space for conversation. Uh, I think also just on the, uh, on the way of basically, you know, how the degree to which we could actually standardize our processes um, the degree to which we can kind of standardize the amount of training that our managers get uh, in supporting these things and supporting basically, you know, reducing systemic bias in our processes, 
um, looking for ways to support uh, and engage with you know women and kind of the diverse community through mentorship and through sponsorship and to making people feel open, the way that we can kind of standardize that in, I think people that are really effective at being thoughtful around standardizing it are gonna actually show a lot greater returns and uh, in terms of making an effective and inclusive um, working environment, whether or not it's remote um, or otherwise. Um, I also will say that I'll pick up on Jen again because she is the source of all good ideas. Um, we also basically you know, do our Friday meetings where you know, we don't meet, do meetings and we create the space for that. I think that's kind of a very powerful signal. It's a powerful signal to come from the leader of the organization to say that. Uh, and then I also make sure that personally I engage in creating opportunities for, uh, for contact and feedback. So, you know, we typically uh, will work out ran a random assignment um, of lunch with five people. In this case, now the lunches have become Zoom sessions, right? Um, and we've been going down the organizational list and just ticking people off and it's amazing, basically, how getting a group together with diverse voices, you know, by design can actually, you know, inspire people to connect in ways, not just with you, but with each other, that they otherwise would not have because they just wouldn't run into each other, um, you know, kind of during the normal course of work. Uh, we also go out there and make sure that we send out um, weekly feedback so that people have an opportunity to provide anonymous feedback. Uh, you know, to the point where if people aren't saying that I hate the fact that you're asking me for feedback, you're not asking for it enough, right? Uh, I have, uh, I think, once or twice a month, um, you know, open office hours where anybody can actually go out there and sign up um, to kind of connect with me. And then I supplement those open office hours by going out there and intentionally reaching out to people randomly um, and saying, hey, I haven't actually seen you in an office hour. And then again, it's all about going out there and creating that space and showing the people that I notice you, your voice is important to me, I care, right? And I'm here to go out there and support you, right? And I think if we do those things, uh, you know, it gives people, especially ones that might either feel not connected, a ray of hope, right? Because they feel like somebody cares. And I think the other thing it does is it helps you as a leader to kind of know enough about your team to kind of know where to direct some of your managers to say, hey, there might be something going on over here. Um, you know, we need to kind of talk to this person or to kind of keep an ear out in terms of like, you know, things that you can do to change the system in order to support those folks. Thanks, Van. I want to work for you. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask everybody to just kind of wrap up now with one key takeaway for the audience that they would like to add for this on this topic. Judy, how about you? Sorry, still learning. Um, I think I've, I've learned so much today by what other people have said that I'm going to take things home. And um, I think my biggest takeaway in all of this, the theme is you have to speak up and you have to ask or the manager has to get in your face or, you know, be there. Um, don't disappear. How about you, Katie? Yeah, I think for me, the biggest takeaway is to really look for opportunity um, in the midst of a time that might be particularly challenging um, and particularly, um, you know, present new obstacles, there's still opportunities. Um, you know, even as, as Van said about, you know, the companies in the, uh, that have gotten started during, you know, a crisis, or, you know, whether economic or, um, or otherwise. And I think there are, there are opportunities, not just at the organizational level, but there are opportunities with the individual um, careers that can be leveraged during this time. And I hope we've shared some of those as helpful options today, but to just look for the opportunities um, while you're um, balancing and juggling um, what's already on your plate. How about you, Jen? Oh my gosh, I think that there are so many takeaways um, and so many great questions in the chat that we didn't get to. Um, I, I guess my key takeaway is, um, is really about um, empathy. It's something I work really hard on. Um, as um, 
as a leader, quite frankly, it's it's um, something um, that is not that that I that I that I work on, um, that I am intentional about, um, and I think that given uh, the the stressors on everyone um, during this time, and I, and I say this because I can see it in people's faces in meetings sometimes. Um, to Van's point about you know laughter and and giving people a break, but having empathy. Uh, I think is really important. And I'm um, taking a moment for gratitude uh, during this time and thinking about the people um, uh, that you are the most grateful for that oftentimes are sometimes the most unsung folks uh, is important as well. My key takeaway. Besides what, watch yourself on Zoom, video record yourself. I will say that I, I will continue to say, I do think that that is important as practice practicing whatever it is that you're doing, um, you always get better at it. Thanks, Jen. And how about you, Van? I think my first takeaway is I need to plan my Zoom setup for these a little bit better because my battery is on 5% and I have nobody to run to go and grab a power cord for. Uh, you know, but I think my second takeaway is, you know, just how important and useful having these conversations are. I want to give uh, you know a kudos out. I have uh, internally an advisory group uh, within IT on diversity, equity, and inclusion. We call it Dig It, and uh, you know I met with that group twice uh, prior to kind of coming in here. You know, shared some of the questions with them, tried to get an understanding of what they were feeling, what they were thinking, and you know the conversation was just you know not just immensely useful, but it was just you know kind of refreshing. And then coming over here and then having this conversation and hearing the diversity of ideas and, and you know, seeing some of the questions like Jen, I'm like, oh man, I wish we could dig into some of these things. Uh, we have to find the time to, to make room for these types of conversations and get more people and more voices engaged because I am not an expert by any stretch of the imagination. And being able to kind of hear from the people that are experts because they're experts at living their lives and they're learning what works and other people can actually, you know, take stuff away from that. Um, that is huge. That's kind of my takeaway. And, you know, my commitment coming away from this is to make more time. And then somebody on the, the, the questions shamed me and made me realize that I absolutely positively need to be doing more to be an active participant and support my wife, at least at a 50, 50 level. Uh, and so, you know, I am going to go back and I'm going to drive my, uh, you know, executive advisor insane. Um, by making sure that I have the right level of room um, for my family. So thank you. Thanks, Matt, Van. Um, so I'd like to turn this back to Shore, who will perhaps go through a couple of questions that have been identified and then some wrap things up. So thank you to all of our panelists. You've been great. Thank you from me too, and thank you, Deborah. Um, we have a couple of minutes, so I'm going to go through some of the questions that are submitted in Q&A, and you all feel free to browse through them, and also let me know if you have one that you want to take on. Um, one is coming from Jennifer. How are you managing workloads for teams while expecting to be short of staff for the future due to hiring restrictions? And any of you who likes to take that? I'll take that quickly because I think that um, uh, we certainly are dealing in, in challenging times. And so thank you for pointing out that um, most campuses, if not all campuses, uh, uh, probably have put in place hiring restrictions. Um, UC Berkeley certainly has in terms of you know, a, a hiring freeze with a big exception process. Um, I think that one of the, this, one of the things that um, has been really successful, and we just had a presentation on it today from one of my staff members who started up um, a, an internship program where um, we actually are offering 50% internships in a service management team that then enables someone from another team to take that internship, work 50% time for six months you know, or nine months, um, and we, we do that the same in security. So um, I, I think that thinking about managing workloads by you know, shifting, if you have it, 
um, shifting some responsibilities, you know, to other units where there's more capacity or encouraging people to step up is important. I will also say that um, here's, here's the real truth. If I hear do, you know, more with less, I'm going to scream. Um, that's really, you know, I, I am. And you know what? And when they tell me do less with less, I, I have to say we have to walk the walk there as senior leadership. Um, because after years and years and years of budget cuts, and, and I think many campuses are feeling very constrained resource-wise, Berkeley certainly has been in a very difficult financial position. Um, we can't let it ring hollow anymore. We have to figure out what not to do. Um, and, and that may mean you know, um, paying for the campus in, in other ways, and you have to articulate that. That's a job. A, the job as someone who's responsible at that level is to articulate what the trade-offs are and, and the value proposition. But, um, but I think we have to be realistic about what we can and can't do. Thank you, Jen. I'll um, take on one more question, maybe two. Where can women increase their knowledge and skills in technology to advance their careers? Can I um, take a stab at that one first? Of course. So, you know, I think this is an interesting one because I feel like, uh, you know, this is uh, so many times men go into roles um, without actually having that knowledge and skills in the first place. And they kind of grow into the knowledge and skills in the roles. Right. Uh, so, you know, I think that when we kind of frame, you know, our question in that way, um, it's already limiting somewhat. You know, I think one thing that might be helpful is to kind of recognize, uh, you know, what it is that you're looking for. Um, make sure that you're going out there and leveraging, you know, your network fully uh, to be able to try to create opportunities for that. Um, you know, if you haven't kind of created any mentorship relationships, uh, if you don't have any sponsors, um, you know, invest time into kind of actually developing those relationships. Um, and kind of make it be known that you're looking out there, put it out into the world, into your workplace, that this is the type of area that you're looking for. And I know that, um, you know, as a, a manager throughout my entire career, um, you know, I've gone out of my way when I know that there is somebody who's actually looking to kind of move into the role to either basically structure opportunities for training, um, you know, kind of support the creation of mentorship programs, sponsorship programs, internships, whatever it is that we can co possibly do in order to kind of make that happen. But I don't think that we should use knowledge and skills as kind of like, you know, this is the, the barrier towards us trying to kind of advance in our careers. Thank you, Van. We unfortunately don't have enough time to take on more questions, but I promise your questions will be taken care of with advisory board. We'll take them there and use it perhaps to form another panel or keynote. With that, I would like to wrap up um, by um, reading one of the comments um, that really um, sums it all up. I appreciate that all of you are emphasizing humanity. Thank you. And um, with that, I also would like to express my gratitude to our panel presenters and um, keynote and moderator for your insightful uh, presentations and um, ex explaining about these pressing topics. Thank you so much for being here today. And I'd like to thank our participants for joining and helping us to kick off our inaugural event. As we discussed, other altered environments present new opportunities. Your voice matters. I hope you're inspired to continue this conversation and be the change leaders who open new doors to opportunities that close gender gaps by embracing diversity, equity, and inclusion. In closing, we would like to hear your ideas for future topics and would appreciate your thoughts on today's experience. We will follow up with a survey, which will be sent to you as soon as you disconnect from this Zoom session. So watch out for that. And please visit our site at womanintech.uci.edu to stay connected. We look forward to seeing you again soon and hosting future events. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great rest of your evening. <laughs>